for some unknown reason. I've never been able to really identify it. Uh, and I always know what's going to happen. And I try to avoid it, but I don't, it always just comes back to me. It just There's something about a baptism that just overwhelms me. And for me to be a part of it is just something that, that, uh, that I treasure. I will treasure for the rest of my life. And so thank you guys for making me a part of your family, for your home. Okay? Now, if you're here for a minute here, we'll go on by. Prayer of illumination. Please join me if you have your... Merciful God, your word is our way of truth and life. Create in us hearts that are clean and put your Holy Spirit within us so that we may receive your grace and declare your praise forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> It's kind of odd. Here we have a baptism and the renewal and the, and the child being baptized and being a part of the, of the family of God and all of that. It's all new. And, and, it, and, it, and I already revert back and now I'm going to talk about death. It doesn't seem like it should be. I, in fact, I even thought about changing everything. But this is a part of this is our lectionary and this is a part of it's a part of who we are. So this part of it we have to recognize as well as we recognize the baptism, the new life that goes with that. John 11, 1 through 27. Kind of long, so I'll do my best. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was ill. So the sister said, I'll visit the message of Jesus. Lord, he is whom you, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when your, your Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, through Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. See that problem? Then after his, this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, My friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let, let's go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles. Two miles away, though it was. And many of the Jews came, had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. And while Mary stayed at home, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Then Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And whoever and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, and the one coming into the world. That was quite a statement of faith. Doctors are busy nowadays. If you've ever been to a doctor lately, you know what I'm talking about. More and more of them are running their practices like an assembly line. They got everything all lined up. And you, I went over and got my eyes, and got the cataract removed, and that is an assembly line. I mean, they had that perfect. Just, you know. Doc Blakely tells about a fellow who walked into the doctor's office. And the reception asked him what he had. He said, shingles. So she took down his name, address, medical insurance number, and told him to have a seat. Fifteen minutes later, a nurse at came out and asked him what he had. He said, shingles. 
So she took down his height, weight, a complete medical history, and told him to wait in the examining room. A half hour later, a nurse came in asking what he had. He said shingle. So she gave him a blood test, a blood pressure test, an electrocardiogram, told him to take off all his clothes and wait for the doctor. An hour later, an hour later, the doctor came in asking him what he had. He said shingles. The doctor said, where? He said, outside in the truck. Where do you want them? <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, my jokes are terrible sometimes. They got, I, I think sometimes they don't laugh just to make me feel bad. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure doctors are used to being kidded just as pastors are. We appreciate doctors, however, those who dedicate themselves to the medical profession. Most of us have one, only one complaint, and according to the American Medical Association, is the leading complaint of American doctors, about, Americans about doctors. What do you suppose that complaint is? What would your complaint be? Excuse me? Not enough time. Anybody else? Well, I love my doctor. She's a, she's a doll and she loves me too. I know she does. But I guarantee you, if you go into the office, it's going to be an hour when you get in the room. I don't care if you're the first, last, or not, in between. It will be an hour, and sometimes longer than that. The, the moment, amount of time spent in the waiting room is the greatest complaint that people have with the doctor. And it's frustrating to be, be feeling terrible and have to wait. I don't like to wait anyway, but it's even worse when we're concerned about someone we love having to wait. In our gospel lesson, we find a family exercising, experiencing a, a crisis in their life. Lazarus and his sister, Martha and Mary, were close personal friends of Jesus. He spent a lot of time in their home. He would stop by to visit Martha, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus whenever he passed through. They had shared many enjoyable evenings together, I'm sure. Jesus was teaching one day when word came that Lazarus was sick and would probably die. Lord, he whom you love is sick, is ill. Certainly Jesus would come at once to the aid of his sick friend. Jesus was Lazarus' last hope. Jesus had healed other people from their illness. Certainly he would want to heal his best friend. Instead of going at once to Lazarus, however, Jesus stayed where he was for two more days. What doesn't make much sense is that Jesus was only two miles away. He could have been there in a matter of minutes. Instead, he purposely stayed where he was for two more full days. How would you feel if you or a loved one went to the emergency room or the hospital and waited 48 hours for the doctor to show up and treat you? We would be outraged. If a loved one died while waiting two days for the doctor, we would be more than outraged. We'd want to sue somebody. We were given a clue, however, that something extraordinary is about to take place here. When Jesus heard that Lazarus was ill, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, by the time Jesus finally made his way to the home of Mary and Martha, their brother was already dead. Been dead two days, four days. However, our gospel lesson is more than just a story about a family in crisis. In the story of Lazarus, we see in miniature the story of the salvation of the world. It's hard for us to make this leap here, but we have to make it. From the moment that Adam and Eve were exiled from the Garden of Eden, humanity has been separated from God, our Creator, and source of life. That was the beginning of it, regardless of how you approach that story. And the consequences were both spiritual and physical. The story of humanity since that moment has been a story of brokenness and suffering, of humans searching desperately for God, or some substitute for God, and God sending prophets and priests and kings in the hopes of restoring our relationship with Him. It was a struggle. It's a story of love that never gives up. Never gives up. Pastor Chuck Swindle writes this. He says, Jesus didn't come to earth to establish a new religion. He came to restore a broken relationship. The raising of Lazarus is a reminder that there will come a time when there will be no more pain or sorrow. There will become a time when there will be no more tears. Because at the heart of the universe is a God who loves us. Boy, if I could just somehow just pour that into people's minds and hearts. That the universe is a God who loves us. That's the testimony of John in Revelation when he writes, Then I saw, he said, a new heaven and a new earth. 
for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or cry or pain, or, or for the old order as things has passed away. That's what's to come. But in the meantime, Jesus entered into human existence to share our suffering and show us God's love. That's to be, this is now. Now notice that when Jesus received the message about Lazarus, he and his disciples had just left, left Jerusalem because of an angry mob. You see, Jesus had given up his heavenly majesty and power to become a traveling rabbi who had no home, who was subject to this kind of ridicule, whose calling was to spread the message of God's kingdom and to put him in opposition to the religious and political establishment of his day. The, the real struggle that Jesus had, if you read it carefully, is very simple. It was with the religious establishment of the day. They saw things differently than he did. As a result, they ended up killing him. A man named Tom Glasser wrote about the day he and his classmates were waiting for their ROTC instructor to arrive for class at Texas Christian University. One of his fellow officers in training said, since we usually wait five minutes for a graduate assistant, 10 minutes for an assistant professor, 15 minutes for a full professor, how long should we wait for a lieutenant colonel? From just outside the classroom, a gruff voice answered, until he gets there. <laughs> You've been in the service, you know what I'm talking about. How long did Mary and Martha have to wait for Jesus? Well, until he got there. Instead of responding immediately, Jesus told his disciples, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And then he waits two more days to return to Bethany. Two more days. Now Martha is the first to confront him when he gets there. She greets him with these words. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now John doesn't tell us Martha's state of mind. I have no idea. I can't, I can't verify this. But I would suspect that she might have been just a little irritated. You know, here he was just two miles away. He could have been there and saved her brother, and he didn't. But we're all human. Some of you have experienced a loss so heartbreaking that a part of you died too. We've all been there. You'll never be the same again. And to add to your heartbreak, you wonder why God, who could have saved them, didn't. Why didn't he intervene? Now, notice here that Jesus could have healed Lazarus from afar, as he did the royal official's son and John. But he didn't. Now, at this time, many of Jewish friends were at their home mourning for Lazarus when Jesus arrived. Jesus and his disciples walked right back into the area where Jesus' life was just in danger. They were going to stone him to death. He just barely got away, and now he's back in the same place. Think about it, folks. He didn't have to face Martha and Mary's grief and disappointment. He didn't have to face the mourner's questions. He didn't have to put his own life in danger. He chose to enter into their suffering to show them the glory of God. In 1986, Daniel Hans, probably, a Presbyterian minister, and his wife Beth lost their three-year-old daughter, Laura, to cancer. One of the sermons Daniel Hans preached during that last year of Laura's life was titled, Caution, Your God is Too Big. What do you mean by that? I, when I first read that, I thought, what? That, that's not right. We always were telling everybody your God, God is not too is not too your God is too small. Hans said that he asked his congregation to share with him their disappointments with God. What is some, I always wanted to do this this morning with you guys by this tidy. What is something you hope God would do? Something you prayed for that God did not do? In your life, what was something that you prayed and prayed that he would do? And he didn't. Well, they shared their heartbreaking stories of unanswered prayers and suffering and death. 
Hans said that he tended to note, we tend to notice the miracle stories in the Bible, but there are many more stories of suffering and despair that God could have addressed, and he didn't. Hans said that he, when we only notice the miracle stories, we get too big a view of God's will. God's will is to redeem all of creation and heal humanity someday. Someday. In the meantime, God came in the flesh of Jesus Christ to walk with us through our suffering and brokenness and grief. You see the difference? See the difference? But in the life of Lazarus, Jesus showed us that God will not leave us in our suffering and brokenness and grief. In the raising of Lazarus, Jesus is showing us God's ultimate, ultimate, I repeat, plan to release us from the power of death and grave. That is his ultimate will. After Martha's accusation, Jesus replied, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, yes, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives and believing in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe this? This is the question that Nicodemus faced. The Samaritan woman face, the blind man face, all of which I preached about last three or four weeks, that Martha and Mary now face. And that's the question facing you and I today. Do we believe this? When our heart is broken and everything important has fallen apart and all the evidence says to give up hope, that there is no purpose or meaning to life, there is no God, what then? And then you stand beside the grave of your dead faith with tears pouring down your face. And Jesus said to you, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will die, even though they die. And whoever believes and lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Back in the 1950s, a pastor named David Roberts delivered a sermon in which he said, Once I heard a man say, I spent 20 years trying to come to terms with my doubts. Then one day it dawned on me that I'd better come to terms with my faith. Now I have passed from the agony of questions I cannot answer into the agony of answers I cannot escape. And it's great relief. In this moment, Martha summoned up everything she knew about Jesus. She didn't have all the answers. She knew he came from God. She knew he could do miracles. But was this humble rabbi in front of her really the revelation, the presence, and power of God? Was he really the Messiah? Was he really able to raise her brother from the dead? She had to decide, you see. Could she pass from the agony of questions she could not answer into the agony of answers that she could not escape. So Martha answered, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. A few moments later, the mourners removed the stone from Lazarus' tomb. Jesus prayed to the Father. And he called out a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Verse 44 reads, the dead man came out and his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let them go. And that brings us to the final way in which Lazarus' story mirrors the story of salvation. In the raising of Lazarus, folks, Jesus sacrificed his own life to release Lazarus from the power of death. In John 11, 45, 53, we read that the raising of Lazarus is the final nail in Jesus' coffin. That was the last straw. The religious leaders, afraid that Jesus' growing popularity is drawing the attention of the Roman government, began plotting of Jesus' death. That was the beginning. Jesus knew that in restoring Lazarus to life, he was signing his own death warrant. And he did. He sacrificed his own life to show us how much God loves us and how far God would go to heal our separation and restore us to himself. Folks, we are two weeks away from Easter. Two weeks away from celebrating the most important event in human history. I pray that in these last four weeks you have seen Jesus through the eyes of Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, the blind man, 
and now through Lazarus. I pray that you have seen his truth, his life, and his power, and his love. I pray that you have wrestled with the question of who Jesus really is. I believe that did Martha, in spite of her grief, and with her questions, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. Final story. On April 19th, 1995, Timothy McVeigh, parts of a writer, Reynolds truck, filled explosive in front of the Alfred P. Mora Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Remember that? The resulting explosion killed 168 people and destroyed the entire north face of the building. Across the street from the bombed out federal building, there stands a memorial of that terrible day. On a corner adjacent to the memorial is a nine foot sculpture of Jesus. Has anybody been there to see that? But this statue is not one of a stony Jesus with his arms out and wide like you see in the Ozarks or in Brazil. This is a nine foot statue of Jesus with his face in his hands turned slightly away from where this act of terror took place. The plaque below it reads, and Jesus wept. That's the story of salvation. He didn't take it away, but he was there. And he'd be there for us, too. Let's pray together. Father, we, we want so many times you do this or that, and we wonder why you didn't. It's hard for us to understand it sometimes, but we do know this, that even with our questions and all the agony we feel, that you are there. And ultimately, someday, we will understand and we will be with you. And that's all that matters anyway. In Jesus' name, amen. Hymn number 356, please stand with me.